I apologize. Go. Uh, sorry, I try to the mic. Um, so the panel is titled Python Introduction, um, and it's all about deploying and using Python in production environments. And to start off with, I'm just going to ask each panelist to introduce themselves. Um, the panelists have one mic. The panelists, if you have the mic, you can speak. Um, if you don't have the mic, uh, don't speak. The same applies to the audience. Neil at the back has the question mic. So if you want to ask questions, just raise your hand. Uh, please keep your hand up until Neil has had a chance to hear. Um, and lastly, we have from Bandar uh, Pontus, DBD. Um, oh, uh, we have the UC Plastic. So if the panelists think that your question is a great question, <laughs> um, you will get one of these. We have six like options. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let's start. I mean, yeah, just in, uh, yeah, so if you are, say, uh, roughly what kind of production environment you work with. Hi. I'm still Colin Alston. I work for the Precult Foundation, and I run our site reliability engineering team. Um, we use a lot of Python in production um, with Docker and a lot of monitoring stuff as well. I'm Stefano Rivera. Um, I do some development stuff and operations for Yola, a lot of Python in production and some other things. Hi, I'm Bryn Divey. I run the cloud for Cape Town in, at Oracle. Um, and we run Python in production on um, big service-based architecture w over thousands of machines. Hi, my name is Andy Rabaliati. I work at uh, the Center for High Performance Computing in Cape Town. Um, our Python stuff is uh, mostly to do with um, user accounting and uh, tracking. And we also do some uh, Python stuff uh, for the Earth Observation people that um, I've previously programmed and still maintain. Hi, I'm Milton Madanda. I work at the Pericle Foundation. Um, most of the uh, Python stuff that we do is Django. Um, we also got a bit of Pyramid stuff. Um, and recently we're running it in Docker and uh, Mesos and Marathon. Great. Um, to kick things off, I um, would like to hear from each panelist um, what are your favorite deployment tools, um, and what are your least favorite? Um, I would say, funny enough, uh, GitHub. We actually use it a bit in the deployment space. Um, when we hook it up with, uh, with when we use the webhooks, we kind of use a lot of that when we integrate with our deployment, uh, some of the tools that we have. So it helps us automate that process quite a bit. Um, the tool I least like, I've had quite a bit of issues with Puppet recently. Um, it's not my favorite tool, so I'll, I'll definitely say that. Um, I don't really feel I have a whole lot of experience to be able to, to uh, m pull any punches here, but we use GitHub and um, uh, uh, Django for the, as our um, deployment framework, and um, I SSH in and say git pull on the uh, main site. <laughs> Yeah, at the other end of the spectrum there, we're a big enterprise. So we build an ISO once a quarter, and we do a massive upgrade sweep, rolling upgrade sweep across sites, and that is my least favorite deployment tool. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, we're busy looking into new options there, looking at uh, containerization and breaking out our service deployment and working on a much less monolithic platform. Um, so at Yola, we use our own deployment tool, which I'm going to be talking about a bit later today. Come to that if that interests you. Um, maybe I aimed the microphone in the wrong direction. Um, and otherwise, outside of work, a lot of my Python deployment is a SSH into box and git pool, because when something's running on one machine, that works. And simple is better. So we have a couple of hundred machines, so SSHing in and doing git pull would be really horrible. Uh, we have our own custom deployment system. Um, it's an open source project called Sideloader. Uh, I don't really recommend you use it. It's kind of um, 
customized for our purposes and so reading between the lines horrible um, <laughs> but it works really well for what we do it's sort of a push button deployment and it also connects to the github api so as soon as there's a, a merge into the master branch of a repository it automatically builds a package um, a debian package and then there's another piece of software we've written to distribute that to servers um, that kind of works alongside puppet so we're using a lot of the Puppet integration as well. So it's really quite hairy, but we can sort of automatically generate manifests as a machine comes up and bootstrap it with everything. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, do we have any? I mean, I'll try and just flip through. Well, we don't. Which microphone is doing this? <laughs> I can, but that doesn't help. So can I. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I just think. No, that doesn't. Okay. Um, yeah. So, are there any questions from yeah. the Well, you're the microphone. Uh, 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 yeah. Uh, we have a uh, hand. Can you guys hear me? Um, okay, so I've got a question around kind of the build process and around deployment as well a little bit. So what we do is we build a package for an application and that's ideally we'd like to put all of our wheels into that, but it doesn't work very well. <coughs> because, uh, well, uh, yeah. Um, so it doesn't work very well because you have to build the wheels per distribution and depending where you link them against and things like that. So if you build a wheel for Pi Crypto, it doesn't work on Ubuntu 10 and 14. So ideally, we'd like to move towards Estus or something like that, but wheels seem to be the way that everyone's going. So like, what is the answer to packaging? Oh. Okay, Stefano? Um, so our solution to this is you package the application separately to the wheels. And the application has a requirements TXT in it, and we hash that and build a virtual N for each platform that we're going to be deploying it on for that uh, requirements TXT, and the deployment system then knows how to find its virtual N when it all just works. We actually do exactly the same thing, pretty much. Um, we just cache all the wheels on each individual server, um, and then when there's a new package, it'll go and update the the virtual end for that piece of software and then everything just kind of works. Um, Docker is probably looking like a slightly better solution for that um, if you can produce images, but that I don't know if that solves the, the distro version issue that much. Wait, for why don't you go to microphone so you can't? <laughs> Hi, uh, <Nothing>. sorry. <laughs> So uh, how, how much of your uh, deployed Python code is Python 3, and why so little? <laughs> <laughs> well, zero. <laughs> zero. Um, because we haven't made our deployment system supported yet. I want to do this soon. Um, we built everything off Twisted, and as far as I know, the Twisted 3 project is not complete yet. Not complete, but it does stuff. It does stuff, yeah. We need a bit more than that. <laughs> I use Python 3. Yay! <laughs> I think Colin has already answered it for me. That's zero on our side. Uh, there was a follow up question on this side. So it's more of like a just short follow-up as opposed to a question. So we, we tried building a wheels or some wheels for um, like which included zero MQ and some of these things. And we found that it broke on the same distribution because of like a one minor version version difference in libc. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you have different minor versions of libc on the same distribution? It sounds like you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Yeah.
Um, yeah. So I have a question that's probably aimed at Stefano. There was a lot of you know, noise and fuel around the Debian's move to system D. Um, of course, that question had to come up. Yeah, a lot of noise, a lot of you know, anger. How did that go, and what kind of did that cause problems in deployments? Um, as I understand it, most of that noise came from outside the Debian developer community, but on our lists, and so we all wanted it to go away. Uh, there were some system DZ a lots who kept posting to the mailing list under false names that had to be banned repeatedly, and there were anti-system DZ a lots who were posting under false names and banned repeatedly. Um, as to how it affects deployments, there's no stable release with systemd yet, so it doesn't really affect us. The next release will probably tell. So it, from the Debian developer's point of view, I think it's mostly a non-issue. We went from one unit system to another, and life goes on. Hi. Um, so I hear a lot of you guys are using Docker. I'd like to know, are you guys using it as part of your build process? or using it as part of your deploy process, or both? If so, what teething issues have you encountered, and how have you got around them? For example, you know, lots and lots of Docker images lying around, etc. that kind of thing. Um, yeah, that's a tough question. Um, sure. Well, we use, we use um, Docker in both the, the build and deployment process. So, one of the things we also have is Docker Hub inside Docker Images itself for certain projects. The biggest difficulty we have there is keeping some kind of isolation between different things because we have a lot of projects that sort of hit on regulatory issues or copyright issues and stuff. We have to keep those code bases separate and make sure we have partitioned access to them. That's It's not really something we've completely solved yet. We're, we're still kind of looking for ways to, to do that. So. But essentially, we, we just build images through our, our build system. Uh, those get shipped into a, a Docker hub. Um, not a Docker hub, the, the sort of registry. Sorry, thanks. Uh, the private Docker registry for that project. And then it just kind of gets deployed through Mesos or, or through Puppet. I haven't got much to add there. We're really early in that process as well, so it's a learning curve, and we're doing a lot more of our build is going on to Docker, but uh, I think there are going to be environments we're moving from, you know, if you start in a single deployment style and then try to move to a containerized or image-based uh, deployment style, it's a, it's a long journey. Uh, nothing to add. We don't use Docker. <laughs> um, part of the same... Um uh, projects. Um, we also have a public, uh, we also make use of public Docker registry. So we um, have automated builds um, that build on the public uh, Docker registry. And we mostly pull those images in using Marathon and Mesas. Um, that's how we're using it. So we still early on in the stage, but um, we haven't encountered too many issues with related to Docker itself. All I have to say is we don't use Docker because I don't see anything that I would gain from using it. Um, I don't want my, I don't want my applications to rely on some specific environment that I can only create a whole system image of. I would like them to be able to run on the same machine as other stuff. Um, that means that developers can run it on their own laptops, which might run a completely different operating system, like this Mac thing, and it, it generally is going to lead to more reliable software. Hello? Okay. Are you guys completely committed to um, test-driven development? And if not, why not? Um, that kind of depends on the developer um, and the project velocity. So sometimes there's no money for tests. Um, <laughs> it, it really depends. But on for the most part, yeah, we are pretty committed to test-driven development. Um, Everything has to have a Travis CI set up. Um, our deployment system will run tests, and it won't deploy something unless the tests pass. So something kind of has to go through a whole workflow. So we use the Git flow system. So you create a pull request um, according to a feature branch that will get tested in isolation. Then there's a merge that gets tested again. Then a release needs to be built. 
and that will get tested again. And then when it comes to actually building the package, there's some tests we run again to make sure that nothing has somehow slipped through the cracks. And yeah. So every project of ours has tests, and if they don't, we're trying to fix that. Um, the some tests are a very personal thing. Some developers do test driven development, others don't. It's hard to change people on this, <laughs> but we try to encourage it. Again, our build system runs some tests during build, and if they fail, that'll fail the build. But you also don't want the build to take too long because you want to be able to get changes you've made into production as quickly as possible. So some tests are run out of line of the build, and if they fail, you'll only find out after you've deployed it, or maybe even after it's got to production. But I think that's a that's a risk you take when you want fast deploys. Yeah, that's not really a sort of path which we can take. <laughs> Um, enterprise customers kind of frown when things just break when you push. Uh, we do have a very strict uh, testing workflow, so anything which is going to be merged goes through a check-in pipeline, which does take four hours for the normal check-in pipeline because we have to build ISOs, spin up machines, you know, it takes six machines to run just the basic software. Um, so it's a much bigger problem. but it, And that does inhibit the workflow. It does inhibit developers from moving fast, but it means that you've got a slightly more stable product. Um, Test-driven development, as in writing tests before, uh, that comes down to the developer, but things have to be tested. Go back to our workflow. Um, it's pull request based, and we're running tests on every commit, so by the time the pull request happens, all the tests will definitely be done, and it'll be obvious on the pull request if the tests are passed or not, because GitHub has an API of telling GitHub whether your tests are passed, and there'll be a big red box and do not merge if the tests have failed, which generally means that they're going to be passed before things land. We should write more tests. <laughs> <laughs> um, most of the projects that I work on um, are quite small, so the tests are normally quite quick, within five minutes. So there really is no excuse not to have tests uh, in the stuff that I work on. So we definitely require that uh, the software that we write has tests in them. Hi, um, I just have a comment on Stefano's point as to why we'd want to use Docker and, um, yeah, we use Docker in production, and there's a lot of blog posts on um, what does Docker solve. Is the dependency management, etc. But my take is that it actually it's kind of like a with statement, the Python with statement for config management. And so what that gives me is like I can try out something, try it out, and if it doesn't work, I just bin the container, and I've got no binaries or things hanging around in my like main system um, workspace. So um, yeah, that's just, that's just my take. Love some comments later on the team if anyone. Disagrees with that. But. Yeah, I use CH roots for the same thing, and I have CH roots lying around on my machine because all everyone who hacks on Debian basically ends up with those. Um, and CH roots are they're not as heavyweight as a container, but they're good enough for that problem. Um, in general, we're not going to be experimenting with things in production, so that problem isn't a production problem; it's a development problem. Okay, um, <coughs> so obviously we use um, Linux, some Debian derivative, usually Ubuntu, and we do all our development and it's free so you can deploy it to clients and every now and then you find a client that says, I will not allow Linux into my environment, you must deploy on Windows. Have you ever had the joy of uh, deploying your product onto um, a Microsoft platform, or for that matter, Mac, and uh, any challenges in doing it? Uh, we haven't, <laughs> yeah. We don't really touch Microsoft platforms at all. Um, we've had to integrate with Oracle stuff sometimes, which has been painful. Sorry. <laughs> Oracle 11, that's that's not fun. Why are table namespaces limited in character size? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I, honestly, I think the worst thing I come across is in the Linux space with deploying to infrastructures that are just so old. Um, CentOS 5, if, hands up who's running CentOS 5. Like, please, uh, yeah, no one, <laughs> two people. <laughs> yeah, we have to support it as well. It's ridiculous. It's like 15 years old. Give up. Reinstall something. We are running on our own machines. We don't have these problems. Um, we do have a developer who runs on Windows. I don't know why. And one, one of our guys has got my deployment system running on his Mac because he wanted to test things locally. So, sure, we've done it. Yeah, we... Our platform is a Linux platform, so we've never had this uh, this problem. 
you know, I use uh, virtual env um, on, on a, an, an assorted different Red Hat versus Ubuntu versus Debian setups. I've never really had any trouble. Um, thank heavens I've never had to do any Mac or Windows stuff. Um, as Colin said, we use Linux-based systems. I think we've standardized on using Ubuntu. Um, so that's, that's that. And we normally run our software on both Linux and Macs. Uh, we've got almost half and half in terms of developer split between Macs and um, Linux. Uh, so yeah, no Windows. Um, for I, I actually have had experience with software Python on Windows. It's not pretty. <laughs> uh, p particular pillars of evil, Pi to EXE, the way it creates, essentially, it sticks your application in an environment which does not look anything like a normal Python environment is very unpleasant. It makes debugging remotely using like a remote debugger very painful. And yeah, uh, yeah, Pi Win32. <laughs> It's, 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 you know what, I think, I think uh, the takeaway should be if you're going to develop on Windows with Python, stay away from the platform specific stuff. The less platform specific stuff you're doing, the better off you'll be. As soon as you start digging into the, you know, I'm going to leverage this Windows stuff, you end up in a rabbit hole. <laughs> but I have one thing to add. Up. Um, if you're debugging Py2exe, a uh, little trick that I stumbled across a few years ago is to, alongside your main application, deploy a application which just launches the Python console in the window um, inside your Py2exe environment. Um, and then when you shell in, you can at least have one command that will get you into something that looks like your Py2exe <laughs> environment, and hopefully that'll allow you to figure out what's gone wrong. Um, I have a couple of curiosities about um, CHPC and Python's use there. Um, firstly, Python's got a bad rep for being slow as an interpreted language, so w how do you actually use it? I'm assuming you use it with Spark, maybe with Hadoop as well, if you still use Hadoop. And do you use it for workflow management, anything like that? Just because workflow management in large computing clusters can sometimes be kind of a bastard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So um, the, the Python setup, uh, the, the cluster computing um, angle, rather than the, our web-facing stuff, um, runs CentOS 5.8. <laughs> so um, uh, the, the latest Python we can run on there is uh, 2.7. Um, I have run some Python stuff on the cluster. And uh, what I do is um, I just run parallel threads. I don't have a single Python program that uses multi-core. Um, I just uh, split the problem up into uh, uh, different problem spaces and I run that Python program on a, a bunch of different data. Um, I think that um, uh, Nicolette possibly can help you out on that one, but actually there's, a, there's someone over there. Yes. Hi. Um, on the cluster, we have I, I've run in, we have users who are using MPI. That's the message passing interface. So we use the MPI for Pi module for that quite successfully. Uh, that builds nicely with OpenMPI. Uh, in, in, in addition, we've also used uh, CUDA via PyCUDA uh, on those compute nodes that have got uh, uh, NVIDIA GPU accelerators. And that's basically how we speed up Python and use it for real big jobs on the cluster. And interesting enough, between MPI for Py, which is, can be quite a thin wrapper to the MPI library and NumPy, the performance penalty is not that big. Um, the interpreter is mostly calling these very fast C and Fortran libraries to do the real heavy lifting, so you don't notice it much. Uh, the users who u have used MPI for Py, for example, have praised the, I guess what you could call the total time to solution, because Python is just easier to debug and write. And you don't have that compile cycle either, that compile, edit, debug cycle. I'd just like to remind the panelists that they should be telling me when they think a question is a good question. <laughs> As a follow-up to the previous question, how much do you use C and Fortran routines with your Python stuff? Hmm. Um, we do have some OpenCV stuff. 
um, that uses sci-fi to do a bunch of image analysis on streams and we kind of do a bunch of dimensional reduction to make some data that we can actually monitor and trigger alerts on. Um, for the rest of the stuff, I wouldn't say much at all. Probably not, yeah. We have some C extensions like LXML and things, but we're mostly wrangling web services. Whether it's written in C or Python makes no difference to me. Yeah, we've got a lot of management layers, so there's not much C integration there with our sort of network traffic analysis and stuff. We've written C dedicated C programs rather than integrate. I had the um, the pleasure of recompiling um, Python, NumPy, and SciPy from scratch, and uh, let me tell you, it's all Fortran down at the bottom. Um, I don't use it at all. I'm mostly in the web space, so no. Hi, yes. I was uh, be interested to hear how you handle change management and configuration management. Who gets to decide what goes into production, what's really for production, and when you set up things, uh, who's in charge of that, and how does that get managed? Uh, I've the question now. Um, change management, we handle that mostly through Git. So we have Puppet. And everything that goes into Puppet has tests as well. Puppet testing could be a heck of a lot better, um, but this is not RubyCon, so I'll just stay away from that. Um, yeah, so everything that goes into Git uh, for, for a Puppet recipe has to get peer-reviewed by somebody. Um, it comes in as a pull request, then that gets merged in and tested, and then only that gets signed off to go into the Puppet master server to be distributed servers. And pretty much the same workflow applies to, to our software. Uh, we also have a QA workflow. So our deployment system, it goes through a bunch of stages which can be defined per project. So first the uh, deployment will have to be pushed to a QA server or a staging server. And then the QA team will check it out. They do a bunch of functional testing to make sure whatever it's doing is doing it properly. And after then, it gets approved for for deployment to production. And then we can basically just push a button that will shift that build. And in some cases, we also support sort of emailing a set of people and then waiting for a quorum of votes to, to come back and say, OK, this is ready for production deployment. So as I said, we try to move fairly quickly and have as few blocks in the way of developers as possible. So developers have root on all the servers. Um, not actually the database masters, but that's fine because they mostly don't know what, wouldn't know what to do with them. Um, that said, they don't use that root power very much except to deploy things. And the change management process is that if you want to make a change to something, you're going to make a pull request in GitHub. This is whether it's code or chef or configuration. It's going to be reviewed by somebody. And if that person feels confident to review it, they can say thumbs up, you can land that, then it's up to you as the original developer to uh, deploy it and release it in your own time. On your way, you can run it on an integration environment, which is our entire stack on one machine that any developer can spin up whenever they want. And once it's gone to master, it's going to be automatically deployed to the QA environment where you are expected to go and test that your thing actually does what you expect uh, before you release it to production. That's about it. Uh, um, as for the Chef stuff, not all our developers know how to wrangle Chef because it's Ruby and it's kind of different to their normal world. So the operations team mostly takes care of that, but anyone's welcome to if they to fix anything they want to. With regard to production, we've got a completely separate team who runs our sites. Um, to touch those, you need to go through a separate VPN, which is a token, then through a Bastion host, then through a separate password for each site which is run and then you have very limited access to the production environment because enterprise. Um, yeah, so the actual level of change management there is minimal. You know, once things are deployed, they're out there until, um, until the next version comes along. With regards to actual QA, again, we've got you know, a massive set of check-in tests and then we release to a separate QA division, which for some reason has four times as many people in it as the development division. Um, <laughs> And then, yeah, they, they're the ones who actually sign off on what gets released, and that goes up the chain to people in big, shiny buildings in Santa Clara. 
we have a very small development team, so um, basically uh, we've got a we've each got our own testing environment. We check it all out. We do everything through Git, and um, the, we just agree amongst ourselves um, whether something's good or not. Just to add on what to what Colin was saying, most of the madness happens in the staging environment. So most developers will have access to the QA environment, but uh, from there on, um, there's very limited access to the production environment. Um, and since we package everything, usually there's not any change between QA and production. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, my question is, um, are any of you using PyPy at all? And if not, what is the stumbling block, or have you looked at it? I actually used PyPy recently. Um, we run some small um, web projects running Pyramid, and uh, we're using PyPy for that initially. Um, and we ran them in Docker containers. And I found that the PyPy builds were using more memory. I think it was Py, uh, PyPy 2.6. Um, so I recently switched to the Py 2.7. Um, and that has been running much more efficiently. So it's also a part of the experimentation we're doing with Docker now. So not too much experience there. I'm not currently using PyPy. Um, we've run our entire stack under PyPy, um, just you know, out of interest for testing. We've taken a while to move there because, of again, we've got a lot of twisted de dependencies. There was a time where the SSL libraries, et cetera, were not ready for PyPy. That's changed in the last year or two. Um, but now, yeah, it's definitely something I want to push, you know, anywhere which we can get uh, quick wins for, for performance is great. Performance isn't an issue for us. Um, most of the servers are running at less than 10% CPU usage. Why switch to something that's going to be far harder for us to deploy? We wouldn't be able to use Apache Mod Whiskey anymore. We'd have to run it a different way. It's unnecessary effort. But we do run tests on PyPy when we've got tests on Travis, and they usually pass. You should really not use Apache Mod Whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> I can talk to you about that. <laughs> um, my only experience with PyPy has been playing around with it on my Raspberry Pi. Uh, for some reason, the GPIO module, just like that library doesn't work properly with PyPy, and it performs worse than CPython. Um, but that was quite a while ago. I think that was something to do with the CFFI libraries. Um, one thing I did notice with the uh, CFFI stuff was it takes a heck of a long time to start up the interpreter. Um, I don't know if that's been solved or not, but yeah, I mean, that's my only experience, not production related. But yeah, that was solved with CFI 1.0. Yeah. How long ago was that? I don't know. Yeah, a few months. How often do you deploy at 5 p.m. on a Friday? <laughs> um, more often than we should. We have a policy of no deploys on Fridays, but you're welcome to deploy on a Friday. It just means that you might spend the weekend fixing a problem. So I will often do changes on a Friday if I know I'm not doing anything particularly important on the weekend. And I'm usually fairly careful, so it's never been an issue. I try to discourage people from even merging to master on Fridays. And <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't uh, do that. <laughs> <laughs> we discourage it strongly. Um, um, yeah. Or Thursdays, or before public holidays. <laughs> Just don't do it. I have found that Fridays are a really good time to do infrastructure changes, because all the developers are out of the way for the weekend, and I can babysit the problem, and they're not in the way. <laughs> okay. um, there was a lot of talk about um, using Git for deployment. Do any of you use distutils, setup tools, or anything that uses setup.py to kind of install or package things up? for installation and produ production? If you've got dependencies, chances are you're using setup.py to, to build them somehow. That's as far as it goes for us. Yeah, pretty much everything from pip users, distutils or, or something. Hmm? Uh, which, which one of those, setup tools, distutils, or whatever else is um, the current thing? I, I, yeah, I think we mostly use distutils um, for our, the internal libraries that we write. Um, I think setup tools is deprecated. Um, I'm not sure. 
Um, setup tools was replaced by distribute, and now it's back to setup tools again. Um, so yeah, we use setup tools when we write a library. Yeah, so depending on, on what we're building, um, if something's like a big sort of monolithic Django application, then it's just kind of a, a hunk of code with a requirements.txt file. Um, and then that gets built into a virtual env. If it's a properly designed and pretty library, then we'll actually roll that up with DHPython2 um, yeah, using proper stuff. Yeah, we, we've got set up to py files. <laughs> which build our RPMs. Um, what we're actually using under the hood is, I have no idea, we haven't touched those for six years. So, you know, it works, and we, we're still pushing out those packages. So that's as far as I need to know. Um, I was gonna say, for the pretty library, uh, modules that uh, Colin was mentioning, um, we have integrated that with Travis um, to automatically uh, push those to PyPy once um, you have made a new release. Um, so that's what we do. But it doesn't work for the Django um, projects that require a, a lot of other mangling. All right. Uh, please. Uh, okay, please. I would like to ask um, a question regarding test-driven development. Uh, how much of cloud testing do you carry out for your applications and for the enterprise for your enterprise applications at Oracle? Do you have an in-house cloud testing engine? you use? Um, so we use Travis CI. Um, that's basically a testing platform, I think. Uh, we also have some <laughs> we also have some QA, QA platforms that we use to do uh, mobile browser testing and, and functional testing through Selenium and stuff like that. We use Travis CI for everything that's public and for things that aren't public we're running tests on Jenkins. Developers also run unit tests on their own machines, I hope. Um, yeah, to fully test our product requires installing it, as I said, on six machines. So we build out, uh, we've got probably about 500 machines dedicated to, Q to QA of various site sizes. Um, so we push out to either a full deployment size, which is 52 machines, install across that. And then we use Jenkins to run a massive battery of tests. Um, so everything's driven from there, but you know, cloud testing, we're building cloud, so we need to, we have to start a bit lower than that. No, we don't. Uh, we just have uh, deploy on our own servers. Um, Colin, answer that. I have a question for the panel. Following on from that, who, who has a cron job to restart Jenkins every night? No, not a problem. Yeah, we we've got a couple of thousand jobs in there, and it seems to just work fine at the moment. So we might be running on slightly bigger hardware. Nope. <laughs> um, we've spoken quite a bit about deployments, um, so I thought I would try and shift the conversation a little bit and ask the panelists, um, what are the things that you would include in every production environment, the kind of tools and... Um, not sure I understand. <laughs> so let's say you have a production server or thousand production servers. Um, what would you want to see running alongside your Python applications on those servers? Like if you had to... So the main thing I want to see is monitoring. So we've got a, a, a system that I've written called Tensor and that gets metrics to Riemann and Riemann is our primary monitoring system connected to InfluxDB and when InfluxDB decides to work we get pretty graphs. Um, other things alongside it, uh, we use uh, Supervisor very heavily. Pretty much everything we do is managed by Supervisor. Some of it's um, driven through the Supervisor API from remote systems. Um, just trying to think what else. Yeah. Most of that world is not Python. Um, the applications are Python and the other stuff is other stuff. So yes, monitoring systems, all the kind of utilities I want on my Linux machines, and I don't know. Um, well, we've got some Python stuff which actually handles our uh, deployment, our initial on the production machine, so it's basically a distributed init system. 
um, which handles dependencies, uh, running processes in the same place, etc. We've actually moved away from that towards Monit. Um, reasons here and there, but uh, that's that was quite interesting. Um, we've got, you know, we push out to StatsD, we've got Graphite running, we forward all our logs to external Elasticsearch, very large Elasticsearch clusters, um, and then we've got a bunch of internal tools which are very specific to our needs. Um, all of our services are introspectable as well, so, you know, once you're in there, you can find out what's happening. Certainly monitoring, um, for sure. We've got uh, Ganglia for our main clusters, um, which is visible internally. Um, and uh, we also use um, Netmon and uh, various machines, but like nothing specific to the Python deploy. Um, from the application running point of view, uh, we're moving strongly to Marathon and Mesos. Um, that's part of the monitoring and deployment, um, just so that we can be able to manage a lot of the uh, applications that we're rolling out. So other things that haven't been mentioned yet is um, Sentry for catching exceptions is amazing. We like that a lot. And we've been using New Relic as well recently, which is kind of magic unicorny, and it doesn't combine very w well with other magic. It blows up badly. Um, but it's proving useful and telling us when things are broken. Yeah, we also use Sentry. Um, we would like to use New Relic. It's terrifyingly expensive with the scale that we're at. Um, you can plug in a bunch. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> if your budget is. Um, so once you've set up all the monitoring software um, and it's generating thousands of notifications, how do you? prioritize the notifications and how do you actually read or receive them? Do you get an SMS or a phone call or email? So we use PagerDuty. Uh, we also use Slack internally a lot. So when we use stable states in Rerun, so there's a stream of events coming in. If it reaches a bad state and it stays that way depending on the tag, so we tag stuff. Uh, we tag our metrics with either a slow or fast alert and if it's a fast then after one minute in a bad state it'll send a message through to Slack and also through to PagerDuty. Um, PagerDuty, it depends on who the client is, what time of the day it is, there's a whole bunch of rules for escalation uh, that follows on from there. Um, I don't think much of that's written in Python. Yeah. Our systems are pretty stable. Um. <laughs> So we've used PagerDuty for the last year, and we haven't had a single thing. We only use, it's a manual escalation thing. If support wants to get an engineer to look at a problem, they can use it, and they haven't used it in the last year. Um, we also use Pingdom, monitoring all the servers, which we're probably going to drop soon, and New Relic, looking out for slow performance and completely broken things. The Pingdom alerts, you can get pushed to your phone, and we do that, and also emailed. Um, I haven't seen any in a while. The, what was the other one? New Relic, we have pushed to Slack. We've got an alert channel in there that operations engineers are usually keeping an eye on, and when it's reporting that something is slow, someone will go and take a look. So there's a couple of those a week. Um, all of our internal monitoring is pushed out to Enterprise Manager, which is an Oracle um, monitoring solution, sort of single pane of glass solution. And the operations guys run that, and that's generating a lot of alerts, things like that. They'll handle those, and you know, eventually it comes to us when they file Jira tickets. Um, and then we've built our own sort of custom solution for alerting people via SMS things um, once things have escalated to the point where we need developers on site. Uh, by and large, we use uh, uh, mail for the, the less important stuff, um, but for infrastructure stuff and over temperature alarms and things like that, then there's a uh, um, an SMS system. Um, that's mostly an ops question. So by the time it reaches the developers, it's been escalated through the, um, the ops team. Um, we use Slack a lot for the notifications that we get. Um, most of the tools that we, uh, we have for monitoring feed into Slack. Um, and in terms of how we prioritize that, um, by that time, the ops team is shouting quite loudly, so it's a matter of just getting the problem fixed. Do you guys use um, PyCharm 
as an IDE, and uh, when it goes subscription in November, do you plan to carry on using it? Um, personally, I use Emacs, but a lot of our devs use... Yeah, let's not start this. It's <laughs> Python. Um, a lot of our devs use PyCharm. I've used it once or twice as such. It's, it's a great tool. If it does go subscription, I've, I haven't been following this because I'm not personally uh, attached to this, but I know that most of my office uses it, so we'll definitely be buying subscriptions if necessary. I think we have some people using it. I don't know. Personally, I use them and I detest IDEs. Um, I've played with PyCharm a little bit, um, but I use them. It's better than Emacs. <laughs> I'm a Vim man myself. <laughs> I haven't used PyCharm. I'm sure when it goes subscription, if people want to buy licenses, we'll buy them licenses. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you guys run any static analysis on your Python code bases for security vulnerabilities or just uh, general missing variables and stuff like that? Um, so we have a, there's a thing called lint review that can, um, you can send it events from GitHub, so whenever any push happens and it'll run your linting tools of choice on it and comments on GitHub pull requests uh, pointing out all the places where things are wrong, which is very nice because it means as a reviewer, you don't have to pay attention to nitpicking. The bot's already done the nitpicking. You can do the higher level review of what are you doing? Why are you trying to do this? Does, is this even a problem that we need to solve? So the automated testing is entirely linting, nothing higher level than that. Um, for just missing variables, things like that, uh, we do run, you know, Pep8, uh, PyLint, PyFlakes, the, the full suite of what's available. Um, we've got a couple of custom uh, just AST traversals, just looking for problems which is sp specific to our environment. Um, regarding security, we've got a dedicated security team in China somewhere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> apparently that's where the good guys are. Uh, and yeah, there has been static, you know, I've received the reports from the static analysis over the code base for security vulnerabilities, but I have never seen out of the hundreds which came out, I don't think static analysis for Python security problems is particularly advanced, and the majority of everything was, uh, was not, an issue, not an issue at all. So the stuff that we develop, um, we mostly um, try and stick as closely as possible to like Django recommended um, practices and this, that, and the other. And I uh, know we don't run any static analysis. So we mostly run uh, Flake 8 and Pep 8 on our stuff, and we fail the build if those fail uh, on Travis. As, as any developer knows, debugging is something you have to do. So my question is, of all the bugs you've had to track down, which was the most obscure and hardest to find? <laughs> we once ran into a um, accounting issue with Postgres. I think someone mentioned it yesterday, um, where one of the libraries that we're using does some um, uh, select count star in the back and we couldn't pick it up in our queue environment because we didn't have that many users, but in production it was failing constantly. And um, it took us quite a while to figure out what it was. Now that we know that Postgres doesn't like count star, we've kind of just uh, avoided it completely. I don't have any uh, war stories, I'm afraid. Um, I'm trying to remember, we had an issue, I'm trying to think if it was with libvert where it was using the incorrect version of the kernel structure to get the hypervisor, the domain info, which didn't break, but because the, the, the struct had changed, it just slightly changed the result values in sort of one out of 15 cases as the pointer advanced over. Um, so yeah, that was, that was tricky. I can't remember greatest debugging stories, but the one of this week was um, <laughs> not lowercasing domain names before running an HMAC on them to calculate a password, which in 0.6% of cases was returning the wrong password because sometimes it was a capital letter, and we only picked it up later. And last week was a fun distributed system bug where a thing tried to fix some missing data in a thing, and, <laughs> well, so, 
there was a site published to a cluster, but it wasn't published to another cluster. A request came in for it there, tried to automatically republish it. That triggered the centralized let's publish thing everywhere, which looked at a database table and saw a null instead of a true or false. And it read that as a false when it was supposed to read it as a true and told the other cluster, please turn that site off. It's not supposed to be published. <laughs> we eventually figured it out. It was fun. I, I don't know. I, I think I sort of just try to forget about those sort of things. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Um, while we are on war stories, uh, what is your worst deployment nightmare? Well, sort of nightmares are things you also want to forget. Um, worst deployment nightmare? I can't think of one with Python. Um, generally, the nightmares tend to come from stuff like Django South, when your migrations just end up collapsing in a giant house of cards and destroying your data and leaving you really scared and terrified and poking around your database trying to figure out what is going on and what state you're actually in now. That can get pretty terrible when you're deploying to production um, if somehow something has slipped out of hand. Um, two months ago when I was at DebConf, I'm getting on a bus to go up a hill to the party at the end. A developer landed a south migration that um, wanted to add a column to a, I don't know, several million row table, which requires a full table lock for a while. And he didn't know that because he's never done that before. Now he knows. <laughs> um, <laughs> and there's a very nice tool for this that Pocono makes called PT Online Schema Change that does magic with triggers to let you create a new shadow table, live copy data across to it, and then swap them in a moment uh, later on, which means you don't need a full table lock to add a new column. But in general, don't try to mess with database schema changes in MySQL. It's just a bad idea. Oh, the worst deployment nightmare is always the current one. Um, yeah, at the moment, we, since we've got a very, very complicated system with many, many services running, and there's firewall changes, which we're currently having to do an upgrade, and the upgrade process itself is non-deterministic, um, we, we're getting failures in the, the tests there, which is required dedicated um, developer drop everything at all hands on deck for the last couple of weeks. So, you know, it's it's always going to be something and the more complex your your uh, app is and if it's not designed for deployment in the style which you're designing it, which is the case in our case, <laughs> uh, then, you know, it's, it's something which needs to be worked on and there needs to be significant developer involvement in deployment and, you know, developer expertise thrown at it. Something that I find, um, particularly on our production cluster with Python stuff there, is that um, I run on my laptop the latest everything, um, and the cluster is running CentOS 5.8. Okay, So uh, like, I, it's always ugly going that direction. I would say dependency hell. Um, there are some projects that we've worked with in the past that uh, still use build out, and um, that's been quite a nightmare to manage. Uh, there's one that I do remember is that recently with all the SSL, um, zero day, this, that, and the other, um, somebody removed the SSL library in preparation for loading the newer one. Well, there's a lot of things that depend on SSL, okay? And after that, uh, even CP, apparently, okay? <laughs> so, yeah, um, it was uh, uh, reinstalled. What do you guys use for centralized logging? You know, like um, Logstash or Elasticsearch, or do you guys use Paper Trail? Uh, where where do you guys see all your logs in real time, like log monitoring? So centralized logging is a difficult issue for us. Um, on the one hand, we have to protect people's privacy, and a lot of that data can't be stored alongside other data uh, because we're running a lot of systems for a lot of different places, if it gets centrally, centrally logged, um, then it makes it trivial to kind of establish somebody's identity along with all sorts of other personal information because it essentially puts it in one place where it can be related. So for the most part, we just avoid doing centralized logging at the moment. Um, if projects need it specifically, then we use Elasticsearch. Um, we've built our own set of tools now to to ingest those logs directly into Elasticsearch. So it just goes straight from from the machine into Elasticsearch um, and then using Kibana to to provide an interface to, to manage that. We try not to 
Yeah. Yep. Centralized logging is hard. So for the tri for the high traffic stuff, we're not pushing any of that to a centralized system. And really, we don't need to look at those logs. There's nothing interesting there. Um, for some, we don't even take logs for the really high traffic stuff. For some other things, um, we're using an old Splunk, and we're looking at switching to Logstash in the next month or two, I think. So centralized logging is hard. Um, <laughs> we we use Elasticsearch as well. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then we push, you know, we've got gigs of logs an hour, and then we find that most of the time no one ever looks at it, and then they turn off various levels of logging, and then something goes wrong, and you need those levels of logging, because that's where the stuff is. Uh, we've also managed to bring down multiple production sites. Um, well, not, not to the end user, but to bring down internal services due to Arsys log forwarding to Elasticsearch, where Arsys log can't contact Elasticsearch, starts spooling everything up, uses gigs of memory there, Things go down, out of memory killer comes in, starts killing off Zen. You know, the, yeah, centralized logging is hard and you've got to be very, very protective around how stable is your system going to be? Can you degrade logging before your system degrades? Yeah, we don't have centralized logging. Um, we do have, particularly for our, the main scheduler for the cluster, um, we have a system where we post process those logs in order to um, like put um, information into the database and track all our users and this, that, and the other. And so there's a system just for, for copying the logs across to another machine where we do the post-processing, but uh, no centralized logging. Um, I have an ops team that worries about that. I don't have to. <laughs> I think that deserves a, yeah, do you want the mic there? Is the reason why you um, disable the various levels of um, logging because of extra processing, or is it because of just the, the volume of logging that would be produced? Because I suspect that logging is actually extremely compressible. So, you know, like if you do go clever about it, you can probably save it all if you really want it. Um, the scale, yeah. Uh, we're talking, if we do go down to debug level, we're talking hundreds of gigs an hour. Um, and to get it into Elasticsearch, index across it, and then, you know, actually compress it is a hard problem. Um, yeah, we, we're running large Elasticsearch clusters, but I'm always shouting at that ops team to add more disks, because they keep telling me to turn down the log level. Yeah, I would say at scale, it is a major problem. Um, it's, it's very easy to underestimate just how much logging information you can generate across multiple servers. Um, yeah, at my previous company, we were uh, generating 11 terabytes of logs every hour, which was how do you centrally log that? This is impossible, so we just didn't. Um, the biggest problem though is also the disk IO uh, that you're gonna generate if you have a high logging level with you know handling millions of transactions a second across multiple systems. It just becomes infeasible a lot of the time. So then it's better to generate metrics within your application for picking up stuff like that. I think another trick here is you have to be better at logging. Like, developers throw some useless stuff into logs and miss some critical stuff, and unless the logs themselves are thought out as, you know, a serious part of the development process, then your logs are, you know, there's no point in storing 11 terabytes an hour because most of it's rubbish. This is really hard, yes. Um, most of the time, going in and adding a log entry or print or whatever later, when, you, when there's a problem you're trying to debug and you know where you need the log line, that's the only time you really know where to put it. I just want to say that we're five minutes into tea already, so I think we have time for um, two more questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> that'd be good. Um, on the l on the logging front, uh, the there's a Python module which captures all of your logs in memory and flushes them when your process dies. Um, it does some really interesting stuff like sigfold catching. Um, but um, it might be worthwhile looking in. Unfortunately, I don't remember the name of hand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can look it up. No, in, in, in answer to the Twisted question, it's not Twisted compatible. Um, Apache versus Nginx, uWSGI versus ModWSGI. Um, we use Nginx for everything. Uh, we just find it way nicer to work with on Python applications than Apache. Um, it's also not as kind of clunky and XML configs and stuff like that. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, f 
for our other applications, we also wrapped them with um, Gunicorn. Um, not sure how to pronounce it, actually. But yeah, and then we just kind of proxy stuff directly from Nginx. So Nginx effectively is just kind of a, almost like a layer seven security. It's really not doing a whole lot. Um, also serving up static content through Nginx is a lot faster. <laughs> so we wanted to switch from Apache to Nginx for a while, but it's a big switch and the gains aren't that big for us. Um, for the more comp, when you start doing complex things with Apache, it gets very complicated. You've got to figure out which order the modules are going to do things in, and sometimes it's not even possible to do the thing you want to do. But Nginx has similar quirks. Um, for our complex Nginx stuff, we're using OpenResty, which is a Nginx with a Lua interpreter built in, where you can do all sorts of amazing things. Uh, <laughs> yes, written by one of your guys. We, lo we love him a lot. Um, ModWhisky versus UWhisky. We use ModWhisky because we can do zero downtime, or very close to zero downtime deployments with it. If we were using a dedicated Python web server, we'd have to have you know, start one on one port, send the traffic, then shut down the old one. It just gets complicated. It's much easier to use mod whiskey. Uh, we use Nginx, but we also use it basically as a service bus. So that you know pushes off to the services which run twisted HTTP servers, um, and we use DNS there for location and um, and we do a bunch of stuff around. You know, we, we've got massive redundancy, so we use Nginx to bounce back to a server which is actually up. Um, Nginx does have its complexities because if you want to, you know, we've just pre, uh, recently added per customer rate limiting sort of per service. And there's a whole bunch of stuff with Nginx where if you want to change something, you recompile Nginx. Or you go in and remove some if statements and then you apply this patch because that is how Nginx modules are distributed. They are patches against the co core code base. We use Apache. Um, uh, uh, mostly just because of her familiarity. Um, as Colin said, uh, Nginx is what we use for almost everything that we do. And I like it better. <laughs> um, as a last question, uh, do you guys have a module or tool that you guys use that you would recommend? That maybe, maybe not necessarily like a big one that you guys use all the time, but maybe a smaller one that you think doesn't have hasn't gotten as much traction or attention as you think it should have. Hmm. <laughs> so we've recently worked on a module called Elastic Git. Um, it's in our uh, one of our attempts to scale content. So we're using a combination of uh, Elasticsearch and Git to basically store content. Um, it's open source, it's out there. Um, we've been using it f internally. Um, yeah, check it out, it's got docs there. Um, we do a database backup with um, a Postgres dump and then there's, a, there's something that sorts the dump so that it's not very different to the previous dumps. And then uh, we store it in Git and I love that, it's great. Um, within Twisted, it's quite hard sometimes to recommend modules. It's quite a closed ecosystem. Uh, so I don't think we've added anything recently which, which is useful there. Uh, we find we have to write everything ourselves. Um, we have you know, something which wouldn't be of help to anyone else, but the concept is, is we've built uh, modules on top of Fabric which understand intimately our sites and what services are and how to access things and uh, stuff like that so we can interactively walk through very large sites from the Python command line and manage them from there, which is great. There are a few Python modules that we've written and not many other people use, but I think are pretty cool. Um, one is demands, which is a wrapper around requests. And if it, gets a H if it gets a response that's not a 200 or whatever you were expecting, it throws an exception, which is probably what you want. So when you're writing an API client for something really RESTful, this makes it very easy. Um, I happy to demo um, this to you and show you some pretty client libraries using it. Um, also a library called query list which lets you treat, take Python objects and um, search them as you would the Django ORM. So it's almost Django ORM for your object, for your models of some remote API. Um, 
those are the ones that jump to mind right now. Um, I would say Twisted itself, actually. I think it doesn't get enough love. And it's a fantastic library. And yeah, everyone should write Twisted Code. You might need to go and sit with a psychologist after figuring out how to write async code, but it's worth it in the end. Um, changes the way you think about problems and has some massive benefits. The other thing, following on from the last discussion, I would say um, HA Proxy is a fantastic piece of software. Cool. Um, it's now tea. Um, so I think we're going to call the panel here. Um, thank you again to the panelists.